Kako, and welcome to the show. I'm Minara Mordecai, your host for the show, Policy for the People. Today, I'm delighted to welcome and be joined by Dr. Sarah Mizban, founder and owner of Work in Progress Coaching. Aloha, Sarah. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm very excited to talk to you about creativity and mental health and all the goodness that come with it. Um, let's start with the, you know, the title of the show. Hi. <laughs> Um, you've coined the term creative wellness. Can you tell me more about what that means for you in your work? Sure. So um, creative wellness spawned from an initiative that I had launched for the Hawaii Arts Alliance. Uh, and it was, I had been working in arts education um, with the Alliance for a couple of years. And we, and in arts education, we use the arts strategically in schools to um, help teachers use the arts to help their students get engaged and um, basically to utilize the arts in a way that allows for kids to be present in the room and to <laughs> learn how to um, use these tools strategically in a way that helps them learn better. Learning, we know, is something that you have to be able to do. You can't do if you are coming into a classroom with a lot of other things going on in your head. So the arts was a way to bring um, all the kids to um, this uh, uh, to the same table, you know. And so, so we were using yeah. the arts. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Uh, I was going to say, so wellness, and we see this from education, you need to be well, both physically and mentally, to do well in school. Um, is that right? Is that Absolutely. What, okay. Yeah, I mean, it's really hard for a kid who's come from a uh, a house that maybe has different difficulties and challenges mm -hmm. to come and transition into a classroom and learn something and really intake the information that they're hearing. Oftentimes, there are blocks when you are sitting in a classroom, you might be distracted. I mean, there's so many different defense and coping mechanisms that um, that individuals experience in order to deal with trauma mm -hmm. and stressful situations. And um, oftentimes, youth don't have these coping defenses because they haven't been um, trained and te taught how to use them. So, mm -hmm. um, and so often, you know, students are coming into classrooms and struggling because they can't intake the information. And teachers are really trying to, and they're, you know, teachers, especially when you're working with priority or focused schools, um, schools that are lacking a lot of resources and um, are struggling to get their students to learn, um, they are also strapped. So the teachers are struggling as well. So what we were doing is we were bringing in and through this was through a national program that was started by Michelle Obama um, called Turnaround Arts. And so we were using these uh, programs to help teachers and teach teachers how to use the arts um, in their classrooms so that they can engage and really get their students to be uh, able to learn and not only just learn, but it, it brings a lot of different uh, qualities as well, you know, critical thinking, which is a huge thing that in American education, unfortunately, is not really um, emphasized more about memorization and, um, and input output kind of concepts. So um, the arts really allows for students of all backgrounds of all edu uh, academic levels to come to the same table and learn in a way that's exciting and, um, and really engages them so that they can mm -hmm be able to learn and also taps into that emotional side of things too, so that um, they're also doing healing as they're learning because they're learning how to, they're building these, these, uh, these strengths of, we, we're learning how to critically think, we're learning how to collaborate with one another, um, we're learning how to communicate. It really forces students to think outside of just, you know, these kind of um, responses that we expect of them in terms of learning, but it really expands that so that they're not only just thinking about material, but they're thinking about, well, they're questioning the material. And I think that's something that is incredibly um, critical in, in our educational systems these days, and um, we just need more of it. 
so creative wellness spawned um, from from this concept that you know these yeah. these art programmings um, are so important and they do tap into wellness and so mm -hmm. how do we mm -hmm. expand that even more and um, really utilize the arts and creativity to um, yeah. really expand uh, wellness and uh, mental health yeah. and support and, those you know. Um, you, you've been in education as well, and um, I've done some work in education. We know that traditionally schools focused a lot more on physical health or providing resources for physical health with students rather than mental health. Um, we see that changing with organizations like Turnaround Arts. Um, what other initiatives did you see that really um, focus or bring to light the importance of mental health for the youth? In, in their um, learning. Yeah, I mean, there's so much incredible work happening in Hawaii. I feel like I've been very fortunate to be exposed to lots of different nonprofits and um, different organizations throughout the island and islands that are really trying to bring in the arts to really address serious issues with youth. And for one, one example, like Hawaii Women in Filmmaking, um, they have a Girls Reel program, Girls Reel Camp, and we did, it's basically filmmaking, and they, uh, they address different issues um, that are pressing for youth and for everyone, but mm -hmm. really, obviously, we know that the youth is such an important place for us to really be focusing on, because that's obviously the future we have the ability to really impact mm -hmm. their minds and their everything, the kind of holistic picture. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, this these kind of programs are addressing topics that might be a little bit more taboo or difficult to talk about. And we know that stigma is a huge, huge, huge um, factor into why people don't get services. Um, access is another one and lack of uh, there's a shortage of services. Mm -hmm. um, as much as there are people doing things, uh, mm -hmm. there's a lot of silos and they tend to, like people are working within their silos and there tends to be so much emphasis in like urban areas where mm -hmm. places like outside and, you know, a little bit more further out from the center like Honolulu will have less access to these things. And I see a lot of organizations really trying to expand that, but mm -hmm. it always comes back down to funding yeah. and the, the difficulty in gaining funding for these kind of more alternative ways of addressing more serious issues. Great, so I'm gonna hold on to that thought for a minute. I'll come back to it when we talk about policies, but um, right now I wanna switch to options that are available adults. And you did mention that access has been an issue. Um, but um, from what I've seen, and you've probably been exposed to that too, um, you've done extensive research in creativity and psychology for your dissertation. And recently we've seen prolifer proliferation of creative outlets for adults, such as coloring books and paint and wine parties, creative movement, dance classes. So things like that, that seems minor but really um, are popular and growing in popularity. Um, what do you think of this programs? Why are they so popular? Why do people gravitate to these services? Yeah, I mean, listen, the arts, creativity, <laughs> um, these things have meditation. I mean, these things mm -hmm. have been a part of um, our hit, like, history for thousands of years. I mean, these are not new concepts uh, that are being utilized now. It's just that now they're kind of coming back to the, uh, into more mainstream society and are, um, people are recognizing the importance of these, these tools in helping manage this crazy world that we live in. It's, you know, I mean, just take this last year and a half, for example, I mean, we, you know, someone mentioned that COVID was a time for that. They, they thought they were, I mean, there's a lot of isolation, of course. So people felt like they were really faced with themselves. And that could be a scary thing for, for people who usually tend to just kind of power through their days. And, you know, every day is just go, go, go. And you don't really have a time to sit and think about your life and whatnot. Um, and so 
uh, you know, people were really kind of struggling this this time frame to um, manage all the emotions and things that were coming up for them mm -hmm. um, in relationship to uh, the the kind of greater societal anxiety that was being felt. So um, I feel like there was there's been uh, you know an increase in people understanding the importance of being able to find alternative ways to to address issues that might be going on within oneself within one's family um and so we're recognizing slowly the importance of these tools in in our own kind of day-to-day -day healing and um management emotional management and so you know it's it's just kind of it kind of scratches the surface in my opinion i think the real work will always come into systemic change you know i think um, we really have to build uh, an infrastructure that supports wellness within all of our different um, systems, like the DOE, the DOH, I mean, of course, Department of Health, Department of Education. Um, and I think that there is, uh, you know, this is where we can really grow. I mean, um, sometimes it feels a little hopeless that these systems are in place and it's really hard, but when you see that there is this kind of interest that um, has grown in using different artistic strategies um, to help oneself in, in, in our own growing, we can recognize the importance of being able to kind of expand that into other systems that are kind of established in our, in our society. That's a, a perfect segment to my next question, actually. Um, we see that these programs are working in one way or another, people do gravitate towards them and they feel good afterwards, um, but it, they are expensive. It, like taking the dance classes and taking the um, art classes and not everyone has access to it. So how, how do you think the state or the city, like the city and county of Honolulu, what can they do um, to create greater access so that people can participate without worrying about affordability? Yeah, I mean, there's been, a lot of programs coming out of museums. I mean, mm -hmm. High Sam, High Hawaii State Art Museum, um, Honolulu Museum of Art, they're all trying to create programming that do kind of address this topic of, of wellness through the use of the arts. I mean, there was a, a program uh, called Sound Shop that was started by some hip hop artists in Hawaii that um, it's really incredible because it, it brings in writing, it brings in music, it brings the community. I mean, they're working with schools. I mean, they're so incredible. They even bring, you know, uh, bring buses for students, you know, so they really take that pressure um, off of the schools in order for them to be able to participate in programs like this. And they bring them to the museum, something that a lot of students in the more rural areas of Hawaii are not able to do. And so it really, uh, there's, an, uh, there's, you know, that, that kind of access and then really bringing them together and kind of working with these students to help them push them out of their comfort zone and and to really help them grow um, utilizing writing and music mm. and hip hop and something that can kind of be seen as like cool, you know, for mm. youth, uh, you know, who are who are and, and a lot of these um, these teachers, I mean, Puna Hele comes from like the, the West Side and they can re resonate and relate to and see someone that's doing something and making a change in mm -hmm. on the island and um you know and can kind of and use that as a mentorship you know and so um punahela has come to their to some of the schools that we worked with and um and just turn around arts and so you know it, it it's just like the resources are there i think mm -hmm. the hardest part is really um it, again, it comes to comfort zone and like the change that it takes and the shifting of thinking that it requires mm -hmm. in order to recognize that, um, yeah, this is a little bit different and it's mm -hmm. not like this traditional way of um, doing things, but there's so much value in, mm -hmm. um, in this kind of work. And, you know, there's no, because art, art therapy, for instance, you know, there's no certification and um and training here on in hawaii so people have to go to the mainland or mm -hmm. people are coming from the mainland who have gotten you know some training but there's no sort of um 
infrastructure uh, infrastructure here in Hawaii that kind of supports this work. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where, you know, there could be some some growth where, um, you know, there was a task force with some music therapists that um, really wanted to be able to bring local chapters of national organizations, <clears throat> arts uh, organizations that um, art therapy, and they are, you know, trying to, to um, get these things on the island so that it attracts more people here and also um, builds a, uh, some legitimacy to this this kind of work and it really works i mean there are people doing this kind of work and for with veterans with ptsd i mean there's been so much um that ha that we've seen it being effective that really at this point you know we need to start taking a chance and bringing these programmings in with much more um you know an increase in them because it's it, there's so much power in them that i think it's really a shame that they're not more um, prevalent in, in throughout throughout. I mean, the country, yeah. but um, you know, I think especially in a, a state like Hawaii, where there are so many incredible artists, and it's just part of culture that you know, even the concept of Ho'oponopono is like is is uh, is fertile ground for being able to talk about the concept of wellness and through the eyes of place-based work. And I think these kind of things really can bring to light um, and, it, and it stays authentic to, you know, the, the populations that we're working with. And I think there just needs to be yeah. so much more of that. And if we can get these kind of yeah. siloed work that's been happening and kind of combine them mm. with these bigger yeah. agencies like the Department of Education, yeah. Department of Health, there's some of it happening, but it's very kind of it's it's minimal yeah. um so it but. sounds like there are opportunities out there um we just they're not fully funded or there's not a lot of um awareness about them so maybe one of the things that the states state can do is to ensure that there is sufficient funding towards existing programs um and then perhaps also creating public awareness campaigns around that. Um, but the other issue you brought up early in the show, which is what I want to come back to, is that there, one of the issues is that there are just not as many mental health providers. Um, that in itself, you know, to have a coach or a therapist that can guide you um, and make you aware of the resources that are available. Um, and that's not unique in Hawaii, but we are talking about what the state can do here for us. Um, how do you think um, the current laws and policies make it challenging to become a mental health, mental health provider in Hawaii? Um, have you faced some of those challenges as a coach yourself? Yeah, I mean, they, Hawaii has some pretty rigorous um, uh, requirements. And, and I think that's a great thing. I don't think mm -hmm. that it's problematic because I think that it's a difficult field, of course, you're working with some high need um, and very high risk situations. And so you really have to have great training. I mean, mm -hmm. that's a given. Um, but I do think that it can be hard. So for instance, you know, my my background is from my educations in California. So mm -hmm. in order to come here and practice, there is a different um, licensing requirement mm -hmm. that is more than what it was in California. So, it, uh, you know, I would have to reapply and re-enroll into a school in order to, wow. get, um, <laughs> to get hours that, uh, that, you know, that discrepancy between mm -hmm. what California and Hawaii is. And so it makes it kind of challenging for mm -hmm. even someone like me who really wanted to, during the pandemic, when I started my business, it was really just to be able to provide extra services for, for the population and com my community because I could see how important and necessary it was during the pandemic to be able to support people more extensively. Um, and so I think that there are those limitations that make it really challenging to yeah. feel confident going forward with um, with schooling and being able to, to gain. But I, I do get the under I do understand why these mm -hmm. things are in place because it is such a it's a very sensitive field and you really mm -hmm. have to have a lot of training in order to be um, 
and really strong training, not just any kind of training. So I, I understand why Hawaii does that. Um, I wonder if there would be ways in order for, um, you know, even if there were alternative options, for instance, and, you know, like that art therapy background in order to get some sort of certification so that there is, you know, alternative ways. You don't have to go the traditional route like I did, where you're in a, you know, formal graduate program where you're able to, you know, where you have to do, you know, mm -hmm. however many, 3,000 in California, so hours to um, be able to practice. So, you know, not to say that you shouldn't have formal training, but there's, you know, being able to offer other ways of doing things could really increase the amount of um, support that we are able to give to, um, to our community. And also, as I said, there could be, you know, there are so many practitioners and mm -hmm. artists um, that really are already doing some, some of this kind of therapeutic work. It's mm -hmm. not therapy per se, so we have to be careful to distinguish between those things, but they still have healing benefits and therapeutic benefits that, you know, if we could find other ways to be able to provide alternative um, support, it could also be a way for us to access, get, mm -hmm. provide more access to, um, to our community. Mm -hmm. And it seems like it would be preventative too, right? Um, if you create this middle level of therapeutic services and providers, um, people may not end up feeling completely um, in an anxious or depressed state where they have to seek a professional therapist. So the, the middle ground where you have providers who provide um, services like arts and um, therapeutic and engagement and initiatives, that could be preventative. And I know. Um, for example, some of the kupuna who can be trained in um, talking to the youth or talking to um, family members and providing that kind of training. So it sounds like um, there's room for something in the middle, an alternative model. Um, and of course, there's still need for professional therapists and training, but we can also create opportunities for the middle level of therapy and wellness. Um, do you feel like there's room for us to build these programs or certifications in community colleges? And is this something that um, you've seen conversations about? You know, I haven't seen it so much um, within uh, university or college level as much mm -hmm. as I have heard um, for professional development in you know, educate uh, in like early education and um, more middle high, elementary, middle high school. Um, there is that opportunity with the Department of Education to be because, you know, they have a whole a very extensive professional development program that allows teachers to be able to um, take classes outside of mm. their, you know, their own um, classrooms and mm -hmm. expand their own learning, get credits, um, CEUs and to even enhance their level of um, being in the academic world financially and um, and so I think that most of the work that I've heard is to really focus on that professional development within the, the that um, realm but I think that there is absolutely um, room for that to be happening in in college and even through teachers preparation, you know, if we were to work with UH um, when you're with the uh, education department, I mean, there are already teachers in the education department at UH that are trying to do this work. But if we were to even expand that more, um, you know, there's there's it's very particular. There's that one teacher or that two those two teachers that, you know, are trying to kind of get the word out that utilizing the arts can really help in more than just this kind of and you don't it's not about being an artist when it comes yeah. to therapeutic arts and you know it's not about taking classes I, I it's not you know in becoming like a being professional with it you know I think of course there's it's incredible when people want to pursue that but this is not that this is not about art for art's sake this is art for wellness sake and really utilizing it as a strategy as a tool um, to to tap into a deeper place and to really expand 
our own understanding of ourself and the way that we interact with um, the world around us. So I think that there's plenty of um, room to grow. Uh, and I think that now we're seeing how important the arts can be um, that, you know, utilize that as momentum to kind of push forward and seeing how we can really utilize the arts to expand what we already have in place, our, our the systems that we already have in place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, it seems like while we are doing great work with training the teachers and focusing on the youth, adults, especially adults who may not have um, the disposable income to get access to some of these services are being left behind. And COVID highlighted some of um, uh, how problematic it can be to be feel alone and isolated. Um, so I think what you're suggesting is great. In fact, I feel like you should be teaching some of these certification with your background and your experience. And you've done a lot of work in the arts community around Honolulu. So just to wrap up, I, can you tell me um, more about different kinds of organizations and the work that you've done and the, the positive, um, hopeful outcomes that you're seeing um, are to come? Yeah, I mean, again, there's so many nonprofits out there and just individuals that see the benefit. I mean, there's, you know, there's an organization called Sounding Joy that's a music therapy organization, and they're very well established, but just small team because, again, the access and the shortage of things. So, you know, something like Sounding Joy is such a wonderful program, and, you know, it's kind of that combination. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they're certified music therapists. Um, you know, Flo Kapo uh, is another organization that's movement-based, dance-based, but um, is really tapping into utilizing these, these strategies of dance and movement to help youth find themselves, learn about themselves, connect with one another. Um, and so I think that, you know, it's great to see, I mean, organizations like Hi Sam, they did a story, uh, they did a Pecha Kucha on the topic of mental health. Civil Beat did a storytellers on understanding mental illness. I mean, you see these organizations that really understand the value of it and finding ways, artistic, creative ways to be able to um, address this really kind of stigmatized and difficult topic of mental illness. And um, I hope that we can continue these kind of programmings to really break down this concept that that therapy is, you know, only for people that have issues. We all have issues. I mean, like, <laughs> let's be real. I mean, we are human and we're within this, we're having this human experience together. We need to be okay with talking about yeah. these things and, and we can do thank so creatively. Thank you so much. Um, this is really interesting. I learned a lot. Um, and for me, this is, this is hopeful. This is good news that we're moving in the right direction. Once again, um, I was speaking with Dr. Sarah Minsbond. Thank you so much for joining us, and I will see you next time. Take care and aloha. Yeah.